As you may have noticed, this podcast has transitioned to Bridgetown at Jesus Church. Over the past year, we've been on a journey away from a multi-site church and towards a family of churches. Each church will now have its own podcast as it becomes more contextualized to its own location and culture. We'd like to invite you to download podcasts from Westside at Jesus Church and Sunset at Jesus Church via the iTunes Store or at JesusChurch.org. Okay, we left off last week in the middle of Mark 13, which is a charged, subversive, volatile passage at the end of Mark's gospel. Some people think it's about the end of the world, but it's far more likely that it's about the end of a world, more specifically the Jewish war of AD 66 to 70, and then the destruction of the temple, which if you were a first century Jew, the temple was a microcosm of the universe itself. It was the place of overlap between heaven and earth. It was the portal into God's presence. And after AD 70, it was gone forever and with it the sacrificial system, and with that the priesthood, an entire way of life that was two millennia old was gone never to return. Now, the vast majority of scholarship would agree that last week's text, uh, chapter 13, verse one to verse 31, was all about the first century and Jewish war and kind of Jesus near future, but there's all sorts of debate and controversy and divergence about the end of the chapter, 32 to 37. Some scholars think it is about the destruction of the temple, but others think that in 32, Jesus shifts gears and it's about something else. So let's take a look one line at a time. Chapter 13, verse 32, here we go. But about, the opening phrase, but about, you're thinking he stopped after two words, we're gonna be here a long time. The opening phrase, but about, is a Greek way of starting into a new idea. It's more than a paragraph. It's kind of a signal of, all right, now let's shift gears. So in verse 31, Jesus is talking about one thing, but then in verse 32, but about, he's talking about something new. And he goes on to say, but about that day or hour. Now, that day or hour is stock Jewish verbiage that's used all through the scriptures in the Old and in the New Testament for the day of Yahweh, or in English, the day of the Lord, which was a Jewish way of saying the climax of human history, what everything around us, past, present, and future, is all on the road to. For example, in Matthew's gospel, we read this, quote, this is Jesus, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So this is about judgment. Then Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, quote, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And then I think of 1 Corinthians, quote, If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, notice the all cap or the capital letter, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So the day or that day is shorthand for the end goal of the human drama. Now, if you're curious, there are about four parts to the day of Yahweh. First is the Messiah's appearing, and then is the resurrection of the dead, the righteous to life, and the wicked to destruction. Then is judgment, when God puts the world right again, which is scary as that sounds, and as non-PC as it is, and as much controversy is around that, we're all craving judgment. Every one of us, follower of Jesus or not, we are a generation craving judgment, craving for God to finally, once and for all, set the world straight and end injustice and end evil and end death and disease and corruption and perversion to put it all away and to wipe the slate clean. Judgment, And then finally is the healing of the cosmos itself, what one writer called, quote, the new heavens and the new earth. Now, whether the day is literally a 24-hour time period 
or you know, a movement in history that's 100 years or 200 years or who knows how long. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that the day of Yahweh is in the future. Now, before we move on in the text, what does the destruction of the temple in AD 70 have to do with the day of the Lord? What does an event in the first century have to do with an event that, well, it's the 21st century and it's still not here? Or put more simply, what does the first part of Mark chapter 13 have to do with the second part of Mark chapter 13? Well, here's my take. One way of reading prophecy in the Bible is to think of it as a straight line with an arrow to one singular event in history. So, Jesus' prophecy in Mark 13, this is essentially a prophecy, is pointing forward 40 years to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, and that's it. But another way, I think a better way to see it is to see it as a dotted line with an arrow to not one, but many events down through history, to see it as patterns. You could put it this way, it happened, it happens, and it will happen. It happened in history, one singular event, and it happens down through history, not once, but all the time, and it will happen at the day of Yahweh. For example, in last weekend's text, remember that crazy kind of haunting line about the abomination that causes desolation? Remember that? The Peter Jackson film title moment? That, remember, is a prophecy from Daniel, and if you go back and read Daniel, it's a prophecy about a Syrian um, Greek king named Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century BC in an act of sacrilege and blasphemy. But then here comes Jesus in the first century, and he seems to be saying that, oh yeah, Daniel's prophecy, that's already done with, I mean, two centuries ago, Daniel's prophecy, yes, something like that is going to happen Again, And then I think of Paul's writing to the Thessalonians where he starts to speak of this mysterious figure called the Antichrist and in a kind of Daniel-ish kind of abomination that causes desolation way. And he seems to be saying that something like this is going to happen again in the future, right at or before the day of Yahweh. My point is it happened and it happens and it will happen again. Now I think that's the way to read Mark 13. So Mark 13 is a prophecy about a time of suffering and persecution ending in a catastrophic event, the destruction of the temple, and then breaking out into new life. So it happened, AD 66 to 70. It's over, it's done. And it happens all the time. To God's people, I mean, I can't help because it's in recent memory, think of the Holocaust, a time of suffering and persecution ending in a catastrophic event, ethnic cleansing, but then breaking out to new life. As far as I understand, from a geopolitical perspective, the modern state of Israel would not exist were it not for that atrocity. And it happens not only to God's people as a whole, but to you and me, right? All the, I mean, how many of us have a time of suffering or a time of persecution ending in a, in a catastrophic event where it's not the end of the world, but it's the end of a world? the end of a season in our life. It's the end of a relationship. It's the death of a dream or a hope or a healthy body or whatever it is. But then bursting out into new life and creativity and freedom and space and stuff that you never thought was possible. It happened and it happens all the time. And it will happen yet again. The odds are that right before Jesus' second coming, there will be yet another time of suffering and persecution, ending in a catastrophic event, and then breaking out into new life. So, if I'm right here, then Mark 13 is pointing forward to the destruction of the temple in AD 70, and it's a pattern for what happens in human history and what will happen one day right before at the end of the day of the Lord. That's what the two subjects, the beginning and end of Mark 13, have to do with each other. It's prophecy. Jesus is pointing forward to the near future and past that to the distant future. Now, thank you for your patience, by the way. Listen to what Jesus says about this coming, quote, day. About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. 
Unlike the destruction of the temple, we don't know when the day of the Lord will come. With the temple, at least there were signs. There's the abomination that causes desolation, which is a giant blinking light, you know, saying, get out now. There were men who claimed to be, were claiming to be the Messiah, but not with that day or hour. We just don't know. Not even the angels in heaven, nor we read the Son, Jesus himself. Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute. How can Jesus not know the future? How can Jesus not know when he's coming back? I mean, he's Jesus and he's God. Yes and no. Technically, to be more precise, Jesus is the embodiment of God. When God became human, he became human. Not sort of human or fake human or kinda but not really human. Like he became Jesus of Nazareth. And in doing so, he set aside the full spectrum of his godness, of his own free will and volition. Um, For example, here's an easy one. God is omnipresent. That's a way in theology of saying there is nowhere God is not. So when we pray, you know, God, show up tonight, that's kind of a stupid prayer. Like, I mean, I know there's no such thing as a stupid prayer, but there kind of is. Like that, I mean, he's here, you know? I think a more fitting prayer would be, God, help me show up here tonight, right? When we go to school or go to work or go to the neighborhood or go to the other side of the world, we don't bring Jesus. Like, he's already there. Bring yourself, that's enough, all right? And so there's nowhere that God is not because God is omnipresent. This is theology 101. Now, is Jesus omnipresent? It's not a trick question. Is Jesus all places at all? No, he's Jesus of Nazareth. In time, in space, one place at a time. Of his own free will and his own volition, he became human. Here's another one. Um, God, and this is where I might get a little bit more controversial, God is omniscient. That is a way in theology of saying there is nothing that God does not know. He is all-knowing. Jesus asks questions all the time. And I love how people argue, oh, well, it's not, I mean, he's asking a question, but it's not like he doesn't know the answer. Oh, he's God. He's asking a question, and it doesn't say anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, oh, and actually he knows. Like, it doesn't say that. He's asking a question. So when Jesus says, yeah, about the day or the hour, yeah, I don't know because of his own free will and volition, he set aside that aspect of what it means to be God. Now, please track with me. This is not a lower view of God or a lower view of Jesus. This is a much, much higher view. Because Jesus, who right here, I mean, he's self-aware, he flat out said that in the hierarchy of the universe, I am right above the angels next to the Father himself. Okay? It's right there in the text. And this Jesus, this embodiment of God, above the angels, right next to the Father, he became human. A rabbi from the north part of Israel, eventually Dying, what could be more human than death, right? So this is the miracle of the incarnation. It's at the center of the gospel of Jesus. And my point here is that even Jesus doesn't know when the end will come. So it's foolish and stupid and a waste of time to speculate about the future. Even Jesus says, I don't know. You're not smarter than Jesus, right? Maybe he was not omniscient, but trust me, he was smart a lot more than you or I. And so it is honestly foolish. Now, tragically, there's an entire wing of the church where there is an obsession around the end times and Bible prophecy and the rapture and the end of the time space universe. I would know because I was in it for upwards of a decade. I remember I was at this one church in another city. It was a long time ago. A long time ago. Don't judge me. And every New Year's Eve, we would do a prophecy update, okay? New Year's Eve, nine to midnight at church, and like all the hardcore people of obviously, of course I was one, were there. 
And the pastor, it was kind of his hobby horse, and all year long he would read the Jerusalem Post in the morning, and a conservative, kind of right-wing, you know, political blog from Washington, D.C., and he would play connect the dots between current events in Israel or Europe or wherever, and Bible prophecy, an obscure, kind of ambiguous, strange text in Haggai or Ezekiel or whatever. And then every New Year's Eve, we would show up, and he would share everything that came to pass that year. He'd be like, oh my gosh, this came to pass, and this came to pass. Well, I will never forget... New Year's Eve, my wife and I were dating at the time. This is a really lame date, okay? Don't take your wife to Bible prophecy for a date or your girlfriend, okay? It's just not hot at all, okay? But my wife and I were dating, and I remember we go to church, and it's 1999. Do you guys remember Y2K? Was now, I know a ton of you are like really young, but do you remember that at all? People were freaking out, especially religious people. I mean, nutty. There was, you know, concrete hole in the ground and ammunition and like, what are you going to do with that? Kill people for Jesus? I mean, come on. And baked beans and like all this craziness. And so I will never forget, you know, we're going to Prophecy Update 1999, right before Y2K, and we are 99% sure that we're going to church, Bible prophecy, ending in worship on the chorus of the last song when the clock strike midnight, Boom! We're done. We're not coming home. Like, I didn't pay my rent that month. I didn't, I mean, why? Finals, I mean, come on. Like, Bible prophecy, Y2K, we know it's the rapture. I mean, come on. So, that is so embarrassing to admit. By the way, I've come up just, I don't want to talk about it, all right? I don't want to talk about it. Now, in that whole world, which some of you have no experience at all, other than the Nick Cage movie that's about to come out in October, all right? Some of you have no experience at all in that world. Others of you, like myself, are, are, are still shaking. Um, but in that whole world, for better or for worse, it's the chart and the timeline and the sequence of events. Listen, not only is Mark 13 not a chart about the future. This happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and boom, 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 boom. But actually, it's a warning against that. Jesus' call here is not to interpret the signs and chart it all out and decipher the code and look into the crystal ball and figure it out. Mm, Jerusalem Post, mm, Haggai, mm. Like that's, that's not the call here. Jesus' call is to watch because you have no clue when it's coming. You have no idea. You know Jesus is coming, absolutely. And you have no idea when. It's not like the destruction of Jerusalem where there's signs and stay alert and pay attention. You have no idea, so watch. Now, why? Why is Jesus, in my opinion, down on speculation about the future? Well, not only is it a waste of time, but it's also a distraction from the task at hand. He goes on to tell a parable, which is a kingdom story, 34. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. In the ancient world, when a master would go away, no cell phone, no internet, no email, he would leave a servant in charge, the one at the door, or it can be translated the doorkeeper, was actually a prestigious position. It was kind of the manager. He was over the entire household. It was his job to make sure the door was shut and all the wrong people were out. It was his job to make sure all the servants were hard at work. Obviously, in the parable, the man or the master is Jesus. The servants are followers of Jesus, and the one at the door is you or me, the reader of Mark's gospel. Now, listen to what it all means, 35. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. In Greco-Roman thinking, a knight would break down into four watches and a servant would stand guard on one of those watches, right? So there was midnight and then when the cock crows and then at dawn. Now, normally, um, one of those four watches, but here the imagery is of a servant who is always on duty, 24-7, never off. The idea is you're always ready to go on call at a moment's notice, even though a master coming back in the middle of the night was unrealistic, it was dangerous to travel at night, and in a world with no electricity, it was next to impossible. So if you're the one at the door, if you're the doorkeeper, the chance of your master, or anybody for that matter, coming back in the middle of the night is minuscule at best. 
But still, Jesus is saying it doesn't matter. Keep watch. It could happen anytime. It could happen when you are least expecting it. No warning signs out of the blue. So, 37, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. To everyone. So this isn't just for Peter and James and John and Andrew, right? Jesus and the 12 or people in the first century but not in the 21st. No, this is for everyone. It's almost like if Mark were a movie right here at the end, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. It's almost like Jesus turns the face of the camera. Watch. You know, it's like freaky, you know, like in a, in a healthy kind of way. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So let's take a step back. Every time we open the Bible, we are asking at least two, if not more, questions. The first one is, what has God done? And then secondly, in light of that, what are we called to do? So first, what has God done in the text right in front of you? Well, he's come as Jesus of Nazareth, living an authentic human life, not fake human, but real full on, dying and rising in our place. In doing so, he set into motion the beginning of the end. The kingdom of God is here, he said, and the kingdom of God is coming. He also said, Jesus will come again to finish what he started and to lead us finally into all of his dreams, not only for the city, but for the entire cosmos. So in light of that, what are we as followers of Jesus called to do? Well, there are essentially two commands in the passage. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first one is to do our job, to do our job. The parable is about servants who are left with a, quote, assigned task. I love that line, to each with his own assigned task. We all have an assigned task. What's yours? What's mine? There's the gospel. All of us are called to that, right? If you remember from last week in chapter 13, verse 10, we read the gospel must first be preached to all nations. I love that. It must first be preached. This needs to happen. So all of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, like you are called to preach the gospel. You are called to tell people the good news that Jesus is king of the universe, his kingdom is here and it's coming and one day everything will be made new. That's good news. That's good news for Portland. That's good news for PSU. That's good news for your mom, for your dad, for your sibling. That's good news for your roommate. That's good news. And if you're questioning, what is my calling in life? Start there. Like if you're not sure what God made you for, what you're wired for, figure it out, pray, seek God, show up at the mentors for him. Start with what you know. You know that as a follower of Jesus, you're called to preach the gospel. But then there's the role that you, after that, there's the role that you and only you play in the kingdom. Something unique the way you're wired, the way you're set up, the way God made you, the life that's spread out in front of you, the opportunity or the open door that's right in your lap. It might have a name. In my case, Jude, Moses, Sunday, and Tammy, my family. Maybe it's the name of your mom or your roommate or your professor or your coworker. Or it might be a vocation, a job, a career, something that God made you to do, to contribute to the world, to partner with Jesus and to work for human flourishing or for social justice or for the renewal of culture from the inside out in line with Jesus' kingdom and his value set. Or it might be um, a role that you play in the church. You lead a missional community or you're a deacon like Christy up here. You're an elder or whatever. Some kind of a kingdom responsibility. Whatever your, quote, assigned task is, do it, do it well. As if every day could be your last, as if there's no guarantee for your future at all, as if time is a precious commodity, as if you don't have your whole life in front of you, as if Jesus could return at any moment, whatever your work is, whatever God's put in front of you, do it that Way. That's what Jesus is getting at. And then secondly, do our job and then watch. There are three full-on commands in the passage that are all basically saying the same thing. Be on guard, be alert, and keep watch if you're taking notes. In my Bible and the NIV translation, they all have an exclamation point at the end. Right? That's fitting. 
So be on guard. In Greek, it's blepo. It can be translated watch out or take heed or my personal favorite, beware, just because it sounds ominous and rad. Three times earlier in the chapter, Jesus says, don't be deceived. Not once, not twice, but three times, which is Jesus' way of driving the point home. And it's so easy to be deceived. And don't think for one second that as followers of Jesus, we're immune. It's one of the problems with evangelicalism in particular in America is we think we are somehow immune to false teaching. Or we think we're immune that we get everything right. We don't get everything right. We're maybe not as susceptible as everybody else, but we are. We're not immune. So the invitation here is to be on your guard to watch out for false teaching outside the church in a cult, wherever, in Eastern Oregon, like great, and right here in the church, in this one. I'm not the Bible. I'm not, I'm really close. Like right here, to watch out for false teaching, um, to watch out for temptation, to sin. Uh, Sin is sneaky, right? It comes up on you when you're tired, when you're unsuspecting, when you're in a bad mood, when you had a hard day, when you're worn out. That's when temptation is, hey buddy, hi. (laughs) Watch out for the demonic which comes at you when you're weak, when you're vulnerable, when there's discouragement, when there's confusion, when there's doubt, whatever it is, the invitation of Jesus is, listen, be on your guard, beware. And then secondly, to be alert. In Greek, it's agrapeneo. It can be translated stay alert or stay awake or don't fall asleep, right? Stay on your toes. It's way too easy, in my opinion, to sleep spiritually to go through the motions and settle into the easy cadence of monotony where you don't press in and you don't move forward in the kingdom of God and deeper into the heart of Jesus. In the next chapter in Mark, this exact same language of be alert is used again for the disciples. It's the middle of the night. You know the story. Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before the cross and his disciples fall asleep. But then right before it, Jesus says, stay here and keep watch. And in Greek, it's the exact same phrase. Then he goes off and he prays and he comes back and they are asleep. And then he says, could not you keep watch or stay awake for one hour? It's the writer Mark's way of saying, listen, the disciples were not able to do what Jesus just said one chapter before. And we are so much like the disciples, right? I mean, how often, yeah, we get it, okay, great, and we go home tonight, and it's in one ear and out the other. We fall asleep. What does sleep look like for you? Slipping in your prayer life to where your intimacy with God is just off and sporadic and erratic. Or maybe slipping in your reading of the scriptures. That's the good friend of mine a few days ago is one of the best men I know. And he was honest, and I love honest. And he said, man, I, they just had a baby. And you know, honestly, right now, my baby's up crazy early in the morning, and I'm just not in the scriptures every day. Like, it's so easy. Life is crazy and stressful and hectic, and it's finals week and whatever. I'm not saying that's you at all. I'm just saying, you know, hypothetically. Um, it's so easy to let that go. Maybe it's slipping in self-control. That's the first one to go when I'm tired, when I'm sleepy. Self-control and entertainment what I watch or don't watch on TV or the internet, self-control in diet, what I eat, what I drink with alcohol, self-control with my tongue, oh, which is, yeah, not good lately. Like whatever it is, the call is to be alert and to stay awake and then finally to watch. In Greek, it's the word Gregorio. The idea is to wait with one eye on the horizon, to look forward with hope and anticipation to what's coming around the bend, as if Jesus' return could come at any moment. That's how we are to live, to be on guard, to be alert, to keep watch. Now, it's interesting to me that we oscillate back and forth between two extremes, Right between obsession about the end times on one wing of the church, you know, left behind, and Nick Cage, the prophet of whatever, that whole world, and then, listen, rampant hedonism on the other, 
where honestly we don't think about Jesus' return at all, or barely at all. We eat, and we drink, and we enjoy Portland, because it's freaking awesome. And that's about it. We live as if there's no urgency at all. Now, some people, like myself, um, have background in kind of the obsession about the end of the world culture of church and are so turned off by it because I honestly, I feel like I was led astray. And some of us are so turned off by it that we swing the pendulum over to the other side and we throw the baby out with the bathwater. But notice, whichever extreme you resonate with, wherever you're at, like if Friday night for you is a Bible prophecy conference and you go and you argue about the modern state of Israel and the European Union and the Euro is the mark of the beast, actually WW and the internet and Obama's the Antichrist until he's done and it's Hillary or whoever. Like that's what you do on a Friday night. Like awesome, just cool. Um, or on a Friday night, it's more like you're at a Holocene with all your friends and a drink and living it up and not really thinking, not living with any urgency at all in this city, in this kingdom, in this church in this life. Both extremes, wherever you're at, and hopefully most of you are more in the middle, but wherever you're at, both extremes ignore, listen, ignore Jesus' call to the here and the now. To do your job, your kingdom job, and to do it well with urgency as if your master could come back at any second. Jesus is calling his people to watch, to live, with an eye on the horizon, to lean into the future with hope, with all of that, but to also live grounded in the here and the now and to make the most of every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day. And then he's also, to wind down the teaching for the night, he's also calling his people to trust. Now this is implicit in the passage in front of us tonight, it's not explicit, but I honestly think it's there. You know, at one level, the whole end times hobby horse is just kind of a form of entertainment for Christians, and I mock it, and I'm not that gracious, and I am sorry for that. But honestly, it's not that big of a deal. But at another level, there is something dangerous in it. You know, all through the Old Testament, we read about the sin of divination, which was getting divine knowledge from a priest or an omen or a witch or a sorcerer or a prophet or a quasi-prophet, getting divine knowledge about the future. Now, I'm not saying that people who believe in the rapture are like demonic. I'm not saying that. It's an analogy. There is a breakdown, okay? But I'm saying there's interesting. God was against divination for two reasons. One, because it was demonic and it was from the occult and it was, you know, people in league with, with, it was really bad. But two, Because what God wants from his people when it comes to the future is trust. He doesn't want us to know everything. Now there's a time and a place for prophecy, to seek God about the future of the world, about your future, to lean in. I mean, there have been times in my life when God has said to me or to Tammy or to my life or my family or my church, like this is what's coming, get ready. There's a time and a place for that. But underneath it all, What God wants from you and what God wants from me is trust. But I don't want to trust, I want to know, right? Because knowledge is power and to get knowledge of the future is to get power over the future so I can manage it and manipulate it and I'm a control freak, I wanna make sure it's all okay. But that's not how Jesus is. What Jesus wants from me and I think from all of his people is trust. That's why he won't tell us when he's coming back. Yes, in Mark 13, he doesn't know. But my, my guess is that even if he did right here, he'd say, eh, I'm not gonna tell you. How many of us, he wants us, I think, to live in the uncertainty. How many of us live with uncertainty about the future? Yeah, that would be all of us. <laughs> How many of us live with anxiety about uncertainty in the future? Yeah, how many of you are honest? I mean, I do, absolutely. Like, thank you. Like I do, absolutely. As I think about my future, I don't know what's coming. My family and I are right on the cusp of a step of faith and a whole new season in life. We just sold our dream house this weekend. We're moving to within walking distance from here. I just changed my role at the church to free me up to focus uh, more on Bridgetown and the city and writing to 
kind of be who I'm made to be as best I can tell. We're going away tomorrow for a sabbatical and then we're coming back, but not like Jesus. We do know the A and we do know the hour. Um, I'm coming back September 9th. I start work at 9 a.m., all right? I'm not Jesus. But we don't know what's coming, right? We're moving to Sunday morning gatherings, God willing. We don't even know that for sure. So most of the time, I feel hope and anticipation and even a sense of optimism as I, as I dream toward the future. But then there are other days when I feel all sorts of anxiety and, oh no, what if that doesn't happen? Well, that doesn't happen. What if, oh, what if I, oh, what if I go away and nobody wants me to come back? And what, what? <laughs> Like, whatever it is, because I don't know what is or is not going to happen. I don't know the future, which is obvious, but still I fight it. I want to know it. I want to control it. I want to manipulate it. I want to manage it. And what Jesus wants me to do is to trust that he's king of the universe, not JMC. And why did I just refer to myself in the third person? (laughs) That's just, I need a sabbatical. I'm just, that's really lame. I'm sorry. Jesus is king of the universe, not me. And Jesus will make all things new, whatever pain we are at, whatever hardship, whatever hurt, whatever wounding, whatever abuse, whatever anxiety, whatever mistake or mistakes you have made. Jesus is king, his kingdom is here, his kingdom is coming, and one day he will make all things new. And the invitation for you is not to chart out a timeline about the future. The invitation for you is to trust and to work. Whatever it is that God's put in front of you, as far as you can tell, man, do it. I love this city, you all know I love this city. My, the one thing I really don't like about this city, it's not the rain, it's not the liberalism, it's not the, the one thing I really don't like is there is a spirit of laziness in this city, in particular with our generation the one thing that I'm like, man, dang it. I would love to see that change because the people of God are here. So whatever it is that God's put in front of you, maybe it's a job, maybe it's not your job, maybe it's, listen, I hope and pray there isn't a lazy bone in your body. (laughs) He said as he goes away on a three-month sabbatical. (laughs) That's awesome. Ironic or hypocritical? I'm not sure which one. Seriously, do what God has put in in front of you to do, do it with every ounce that you have in the spirit of Jesus' power. Do it well, with urgency, as if life is short and there's no guarantee of another breath, much less another decade. And watch, live with hope and anticipation that no matter what you are going through right now, and I know some of you are here tonight, and you are going through crap, and it's painful, and it's lousy, and it's hard, But whatever you are going through, man, eternity is in your future. And maybe your life isn't bad at all right now. Maybe it's fantastic and you have the exact opposite problem. It's so easy to get sucked into the here and now in a negative way. Listen, there's a whole other world and a whole other life that is coming down the bend for you. So work and watch and trust God for your future for your past and for the here and now. Work and watch and trust. Let's pray.